much do you love yourself? Because if you understand the value of self-love, you'll never be friends with those type of people. Most of the people out here are running around empty. They have no sense of self. No sense of self-love. When I say self-love, it has nothing to do with celebrity, money, materialistic things, and all of the things that your negative mind could probably go to. It has nothing to do with self-love. It has nothing to do with looks. Nothing to do with cars and any of the superficial things that one would assume that could make you love yourself even more. It's a matter of knowing your value. It's a matter of you saying, I don't have to be around these people in these type of environments and situations in order for me to finally see the value in myself. I love me independent of you loving me. I believe in me. I know my self-worth. I am here and I have a purpose. There is no value having wisdom, knowledge, insight, spirituality, love. Every day, I am a work in progress. A person who can forgive nothing is a person who's totally destroyed psychologically and emotionally. Forgive your parents. Forgive any relationship that you ever had that didn't work out. Forgive everyone else in your life that has ever hurt you in any way. way. Forgive yourself. From my teacher, Mr. Show, who said to me, Mr. Rohn, if you want the future to change for you, you've got to change. And he said, if you don't change, the next six years of your life is going to be just like the last six. You'll still be behind on your bills. You'll still be behind on your promises. But then he gave it to me in the form of a promise. When I was 25 years old, I remembered in all these years, young man, if you will change, everything will change. If you will get better, everything will get better. What a clear message that was for me. He said, if you'll change your philosophy, you'll change your habits, if you'll refine your thinking, if you'll change and accept some new disciplines, if you'll turn the corner where you've been in the past, go for a new life for the future, he said all kinds of remarkable things will happen for you if you will change. Before I met Mr. Shoaff, I used to cross my fingers and say, I sure hope things will change. I was hoping the government would change and the tax structure would change and that my boss would change and pay me more money, this would come down. And I was hoping that circumstances would get better. And then I discovered from my teacher that those things are going to continue the same. In fact, all of those things that happen to us is kind of like the wind that blows. But we must not leave our future just to the wind, just to the economy, uh, just to the structure of the way things are happening today. Here's what we must learn to do. And that is set a good sail. And if you'll learn to set a good sail, and that's what my teacher taught me in those early days. He said, Mr. Rohn, the wind is going to blow however it's going to blow. Politics are going to be politics. And the economy is going to be the economy. And however it turns out, that's the way it's going to be. What you must learn to do is not to wish for a better wind. That's naive. The key is to wish for the wisdom and the skills and the learning so that you can set a better save. And so that's what I did at age 25. I went to work not on the economy. I went to work not on the community. I didn't go to work to try to change the government. I didn't go to work to try to change my boss or the company. I didn't go to work to try to change circumstances. I went to work to try to change myself. And I picked up that promise my teacher shared with me that if I would change, my income would change. If I would change, my bank account would change. If I would change, my future would change. And sure enough, his promise came true for me. The first six years of my economic life, I wound up broke. Those pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, behind on my promises. The second six years of my economic life, I wound up rich. 
But interestingly enough, the second six years of my economic life, the government was about the same and the economy was about the same. You know, the companies were about the same. What they paid was the same. Circumstances around me were the same. You know, my negative relatives were the same. But I was not the same. That's how my life changed. Things started working for me, changing my life all those years ago. You don't have to change what's going on out there. That's the wind that's blowing. All we have to do is change what's going on in here. Forgiveness is giving up the hope that the past could be any different. I think for myself, and I know many of you, you think forgiving means accepting what has happened to you. Well, it is accepting that it has happened to you. Not accepting that it was okay for it to happen. It is accepting that it has happened, and now what do I do about it? Forgiving is giving up the hope, not holding on, hoping, wishing, that it could have been any other way than it actually was. Giving up the hope that the past could be any different. And when I got that, I think it took me to the next level of being a better person because I don't hold grudges for anything or any situation and neither should you. It's letting go so that the past does not hold you prisoner, does not hold you hostage. And now there's several ways to do that. The first subject he called personal development. We must learn from personal experience. Pretty simple. Learn from what happens to you. Take a look back over the last few months. Did you make some mistakes? How could you correct those for the future? Take a look back over the last year. Have you done it right or done it wrong? Let's correct it for the next year. Mr. Shope asked me when I first met him, he said, Mr. Owen, how are you doing? You've been out there now six years. And I said, I'm not doing very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. What a simple, swift analysis to my situation. He said, if you keep doing it, the next six years will be like the last six. You don't want that to happen. Let's make the changes. So learn from your personal experience. Second, other people's experiences. That's me, other people. That's your teacher. That's your friends and colleagues. The people you meet that can pass along to you their experiences, what's happened to them, the mistakes they made, how they corrected them. How they change their health, change their bank account, change their income, and change their future. Other people. Now, there's two kinds of people to learn from. One is failures. It's too bad failures don't give seminars, right? That would be valuable. Have them tell you how they lost it all and threw it all away, threw their health away, threw their friendships away, and things didn't work out well. That would be valuable. But now then, we must also learn from positive people that have done well. They've got the health, and so we ask them, how did you become so healthy? They've got the skills, so we ask them, how did you become this skillful? They've got the income, so we ask them, how did you get here in such a short period of time? So now, here's what's important in personal development. In learning from other people, we learn, number one, by observation. We learn what we see, we watch people that are successful in what they do. In sports, we watch their disciplines. In business, we watch their disciplines. Second, we learn by what we hear. Learn by listening. And then listen to the sermon on Sunday morning. Listen to the lectures. Listen to the teachers. Listen to someone who's got something good to say. And then number three is vitally important on personal development. That is, read all the books. All the books you can possibly read in your lifetime. Mr. Shof got me started on my library. I've got one of the better libraries. And then I started keeping a journal. One of the major things my teacher taught me was to keep a journal. He said, don't trust your memory. If you hear something good, just make a little note and write it down. So I would suggest you do the same. Things that impress you, a poem that impresses you. Or when you attend a class, some of the ideas that impressed you, jot them down. You read something in a magazine, write some ideas, take those out, put them in your journal, keep a good journal the rest of your life, this will serve you well. So I want the same thing to happen to you. Value capture, that you can resort to later, go back over it, review it, 
and let it become valuable to you. So that's my first subject, personal development. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Develop the skills, learn the lessons, take the classes, absorb all that is being taught to you these days. And then later on, of course, you can sort it out, what's valuable to you and how to refine it for your business and for your life and for your future. The main thing is to get it and start this process of personal change, personal development. And let me say it one more time. If you will change, everything will change. You'll never be the same. You'll keep growing. As you look back on a few months, look back on a few years, you won't believe the progress you can make economically, your relationship with your family, your friends, telling you that whole process of committing yourself for personal change, personal value, can really make your life unique and worthwhile. And uh, he just said, son, if you think you can make it, get on out there and get discovered. My father was born in 1914. It wasn't good. My grandfather was a slave. My grandfather was born into slavery. My grandfather was a slave till he was 12. So my background of people becoming successful was like, and my dad was the only one believing. Everybody else told me no. Laughed at me, all kind of. When you're going through stuff like that, man, it's pretty easy. I almost gave up, you know, everybody has a turn back moment. I almost gave up a couple of times because it got pretty hard for me. I was going to ask my father to come home and stay there for three months and get a job. Because my father had a rule for all the boys. Once you leave the house, you can't come back. He, he was pretty strong with that. The girls could come back home anytime they wanted to. The boys, you can't come back here. So calling him and asking him, could I come home was pretty tough. And then I got a phone call. I, you know, remember, remember back in the day you all, you, you had an answer machine and you could press in the code and you could play your messages back. I was about to give up and I pressed the code one day and uh, there was a guy named Chuck Sutton from Showtime to Apollo. And he said, hey, we got a gig for you Sunday night. If you can get here, uh, we'll put you on TV Sunday night. It was a Thursday, I'm in Florida. I got $35, I'm homeless, I'm fitting to give up. And uh, I didn't have enough money to get to New York. And I sat there and I started crying on the side of the road, man. I said, man, I finally get my shot to be on TV and I can't even get there. So I, I sat there when I got through crying, I said, man, let me call back and see if he said this Sunday. So I picked up the phone and I dialed again and they said, yeah, this Sunday. And I got ready to hang up but another message had come through since, and it said, Poop. it said, Steve Harvey, this is Tom Sobel from the Comedy Caravan. If you're anywhere close to Jacksonville, Florida, if you can get there Friday night, I got 150 bucks for you. I'm in Pensacola. So I jump in the car, I got 35 bucks. I drive to, to uh, uh, Jacksonville, Florida at the punchline. I do the gig Friday night, they give me $150. I did so good, the guy asked me to stay over Saturday night. He paid me hundred, another hundred and fifty. I got three hundred dollars. See, life is cyclic. You're not what is whatever experience you're having right now. It has not come to stay. It has come to pass. Not to stay, just to pass. It's just going through. The biggest challenge is, is to know what's happening. This is a part of this thing we call life. This too shall pass. And maintaining perspective, putting it in perspective. You have to be willing to break from the past to have the future you so desperately desire. You have to have the courage to allow yourself to honor the past as it was, to forgive those who need to be forgiven, to forgive yourself and to acknowledge that everything led you to this point now. Everything. Let it go and begin to focus on developing myself. And I say to you, you're going to have people to do things to you. Things are going to happen to you. And the most important thing to do is to harness your will and let it go and move so you can grow, so you can get on with your life. It doesn't matter about what happens to you. What matters is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do now, Les? But if you want to begin to move into your own personal greatness, 
If you want to begin to really enjoy a happy, successful, healthy life, you've got to be willing to go against the tide. You've got to be willing to harness your will. So as you're in the process of reinventing your life, write a description of the kind of person that you want to be. What are the things that you must overcome? What qualities about your personality you know that you're going to have to change because those particular characteristics are liabilities to you? What are your assets? What are your strong points? Look at and evaluating yourself to make that determination. Other thing is that in order to get out of a wreck, we need some coaching. Find some trusted critics. People that you know care about you and love you. So there's some things that keeps us from growing and getting out of ruts. Number one, we identify with feedback. We take it personal when someone wants to give us some feedback on where we are falling short and tell us about our blind spots. We want to have everything being positive about us. We're not perfect. It's, it hurts. I, I have a friend who's a trusted critic. I don't like him, but I love him. He doesn't tell me the things I want to hear. He tell me what I need to hear so I can grow. It hurts. It hurts when he put me on the hot seat. I can't stand it. But that's the only way that I can grow. And I'm glad that he loves me enough to risk our friendship to tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. Now let's cover the second step, the setting goals. We need to take a look into the future. There are four things to consider in terms of attitude. One is how you feel about the past. Best advice I can give you on that is treat the past as a school. Let it teach you the mistakes you've made, the things that went wrong, the things that didn't work. Don't use the past as a burden to carry. And don't use the past as a club to beat yourself to death. Past losses, past failures, past mistakes. But let the past be a school. Tough school, maybe. We've all been through some tough stuff. So if you feel good about the past, draw from it for experience and let it teach you. Then next is how you feel about the future. We've got to have the future well designed. The future is called the promise. The promise of the future can be an awesome force. Designing the future, there's two ways to face the future. One is with apprehension, and the other is with anticipation. I promise you, in my travels around the world, most people face the future with apprehension. And here's why, they don't have it well designed. They've sort of left that up to someone else to fix. Here's the best way to face the future with anticipation. You can face the future with anticipation if the future is clear, if the future is well designed. In setting goals, it's very simple. Number one, decide what you want. You just take a little time, you sit down and say, what do I want? What kind of skills do I want? What kind of income do I want for the future? Where would I like to go? Places I'd like to visit? habits I'd like to acquire, skills I'd like to have, economics, friendships, people you'd like to meet. When you've thought about what you want for the future, make a list. If the future gets clear, the price gets easy. Because you gotta remember, for every promise, there's a price to pay. Everybody's gotta pay the price. Everybody's gotta do the deal. Everybody's gotta do the discipline. But here's what I've discovered. If the promise is clear and powerful, the price is easy to pay. The price is some classes, the price is a few books, the price is a few disciplines. The price is finding something that'll make your life better, make you grow, make you change, make you develop. So the first part of the key is to design the promise. Then, what is the price to pay? I'm telling you, the price will be easy. No matter where you are, where you come from. Color doesn't matter, religion doesn't matter, where you grew up doesn't matter, circumstances don't matter. I'm telling you, if you'll make the promise of the future clear for yourself, all of the values of life that you could possibly want, be serious about it. I promise you it's an easy price to pay. Anybody can pay it. And the best advice I can give you is if I can do it, you can do it. Farm boy from Idaho, raised in obscurity. I changed my life, turned it upside down, turned it all around found economics, found future, found promise, and if I can do it, you can do it. So start setting your goals and see if you can't get a better excitement going 
for the things you want to accomplish for the future. One of the major reasons for setting goals is for what they make of you in achieving them. My teacher advised me when I first got started at age 25, he said, Jim, why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? I'm here to help you. And he said, here's why, for what it will make of you to achieve. I'm telling you that statement changed my life. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve. He said, now, once you become a millionaire, what's important is not the money. It isn't important. He said, you could just give the money away. Now, I did better than that. I lost it all. By the time I was 31, I was a millionaire. By the time I was 33, I was broke. But when I lost all my money, guess what? I found out Mr. Schoff was right. What was valuable was not the money. What was valuable was what I became to earn the money. The skills I had, the knowledge I had about the marketplace, the values that I had going for me, they were more valuable than the money. And here's an important statement to remember. It's not what you get that makes you valuable. It's what you become. So part of the key here is to set the kind of goals that will make something of you. Don't set them too low so that you don't have to grow and you don't have to read and you don't have to try and you don't have to stretch. Don't set them too low. And then don't sell out. Don't go for something that's going to cost you your virtue or cost you your values or sell out your principles. There's a good middle road here to follow. Goals that will inspire, goals that will help you grow, change, develop, and become better than you. High performers are not dissatisfied strivers. They're not. They're happy. High performers are happier than their peers. We all believe that to get the top, it's going to be lonely at the top. And we all believe you have to grind and kill yourself to get there. Yeah. And that's completely wrong. And yes. the data proves it worldwide, which is, I think, just overcoming a lot of people's biases about how you work today. Because right now, especially today, like, you know, grind on social media is so popular. Or hustle. Or hustle. And it, it, by the way, none of the top 15% of high performers worldwide identify with those words. They literally don't. We asked them, we did a whole keyword analysis. Yeah. This was actually pretty cool. And high performers explicitly say, these, these are the three driving feelings. If we said there was a high performance state, mm -hmm. it's, it's driven from these three things. Number one, full engagement. Yes. Number two, joy. Yes. And number three, confidence. Yes. That's what they relate with, okay? That's where it's coming from. It's a joyous journey, not a dissatisfied one. And this, I had this conversation in the book um, because uh, uh, I kind of maybe frame it this way. Each of these chapters opens with a vignette of somebody I worked with or a situation that I was in that demonstrated high performance. In this particular situation, I'm walking on a stage, thousands of people, after a very famous musician was out there and was telling the audience that that person's secret to success, remember thousands of people, yes. their secret to that, their whole speech, their secret to success was never settle. Never settle, nothing is enough, never settle. And never be satisfied, never be satisfied, always demand more. And I'm like, oh, my second slide, which was gonna be on jumbotrons in like 80 point text, was strive satisfied. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have to dispel this for all these thousands of people. I was totally freaked out. Yeah. And, but what I had to explain to people was not only the data, but it's this. Uh, if you're never satisfied, I mean, what, what, is, is it true that life is precious? If it's true that life is precious and you could be gone tomorrow, do you really wanna think, you know what? I just never felt fulfilled. I never allowed myself to have a moment of credit I never allowed myself to have a moment of peace. I never allowed myself to look at that and say, good job. That's not the way to live life. I think just at a spiritual level, it's a bad move. And this book doesn't really go into a lot of that. It's more about the science and the heart stuff. But I think it's really important that people realize your job is to strive satisfied. And if you strive satisfied more often, you will be more of a high performer. And if you never give yourself credit, you're always beating up on yourself. You're always thinking that's not perfect enough.
Now listen to me. I don't care if you're sick. I don't care what you're going through. If you're not dead, he ain't through with you yet. As long as you're waking up, you're still in the game. You can still make it happen. As long as that breath in your nostrils, boo, you're still in the game. You still can win. Now get your butt up. God may be giving you more to work with than what you are working with at this time. That's why I don't like to hang with low-thinking people, because they'll make you underutilize what God has given you. You need somebody to challenge you that you could be doing more than what you're doing right now. You could have more than you have right now. You could go further than you're going right now. And somebody's got to be bold enough to look you in the face and empower you to go into the enemy's camp and take back what he stole from you. And if you're not careful, you will allow situations in this life to cloud your perspective. And you will allow moments in this life to take away the hopes and the dreams of tomorrow. Failure, it's not final, it's formative, it's part of the journey. How are you gonna learn if you don't ever fail? Failure is fuel for your future. Failure is a part of your story. The only time you fail is the last time you try. You need to get the right perspective on it because this failure, it will not end in death, but this failure is a part of you being formed. Don't take the presence of the storm to indicate the absence of God. Sometimes when you enter into a storm and there are all kinds of storms, health storms, financial storms. There are all kinds of storms. I'm talking about storms that other people can't see. Storms that make people think you haven't been through anything. Because you get up out of bed every morning and you put your hair up and put your makeup on and, and they don't know you put your smile on just like you did your makeup and, and walked in smiling because you were going through a secret storm. Has anybody ever gone through a secret storm? is enveloping the whole world hard to see out of that storm it's hard to see past it it seems like the storm is everything you can get out of the storm and you will get out of the storm but right now you're being tried you're being forged you're being tested by fire and by pain don't fail the test And if God be for us, who can be against us? There's nothing in this world that can defeat us if God is for us. It is impossible to have victory and think bondage. It's impossible to be happy and think sadness and depression. You can pick up ideas that can change your life starting tomorrow. Just be a more careful observer. Now remember, there's two ways to see. One is called sight. The other one is called insight. See with your eyes, you'll see things. See with your mind, you'll see answers. Put your eyes and your mind to work. Don't miss anything. You've got to learn to zero in and concentrate. Wherever you are, be there. I'm encouraging you to be mindful and be deliberate of what you let in your mind. Be concerned about what's going on and do the things necessary that keeps you out of harm's way. But don't be consumed with it. So make up your mind to wake up with prayer, to watch something that inspire you, that lift you up. As you rethink your life in self-examination, this is a time to look at the relationships in your life and ask the question, what kind of person am I becoming because of this relationship? Am I growing mentally and emotionally and spiritually? Am I becoming a better person because of this relationship? Is it an asset to me or a liability? And 
And a lot of times, by the time people really get down to seeing who you really are, they run from you. What we really want is for somebody to love us for who we are. And what we really want is to have the kind of intimate relationship with them that allows us the freedom of not needing to camouflage who we are, what we think, how we speak, and how we understand. Without that freedom, we begin to be actors acting out a role in the house for which we eventually become weary of and we break out of the role because we want to be free to be ourselves. I think don't save that last bullet for yourself. You lock and load that last bullet and you shoot it at your enemy. And you keep fighting and you keep fighting no matter what. And you never quit. And if you feel like your life is in a place where you can't get any lower, good. Because that means the ultimate challenge is ahead of you. It means you can only go up. As long as God wakes you up, that means he ain't through with you yet. And if he wakes you up, you got a shot to correct it and get it right. That also means that he has something for you that you've yet to receive. Life's just never done with you. Knowing that every day you get up, you have a choice. You get to choose if you're going to make the right decisions or you get to choose if you're going to make the wrong ones. And every day you wake up, you get to take the test and you get to see how you do. When you realize your game is bigger than just you, that's where the power's at, to lead. So be the best leader you can be for yourself and for the people that you care about. Program your mind because all that you will do or not do, have or not have, accomplish or not accomplish, will be a direct derivative of what's going on inside of your mind. So if you don't get clear thinking on an issue, you won't be able to develop in that area. It's about mentality, getting the right man. I thought of the child, I spake of the child, I understood of the child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Discipline is defined as self-imposed standards for the sake of a higher goal. All leaders have to have the quality of self-discipline. You are not a leader if you are not self-disciplined. A leader doesn't need much discipline from the outside. They self-impose discipline on themselves. And that is what we call self-discipline. When it feels like you've taken steps backwards, don't sit around and sulk. Don't live life defeated. Stay in faith. You may not realize it, but you're in a good position. You're being pruned, not so you can stay there. No, you're being pruned so you can go to a new level, so you can see new growth and experience new opportunities and discover new potential. You must now take action on what you found out. We call it game plan. Put together your game plan. A business game plan. Everybody needs game plans. Financial independence, game plan. Your investment, game plan. I often ask somebody, what are you going to do the next six months? And somebody starts to tell me. I say, no, don't tell me. Show me. Show me your game plan for the next six months. Then I can look at things and maybe I can help. Put it on a game plan. Take action on what you found out. Now, here's the best word I know of to go with action. Massive. See, that'll change everything. You are everything. Keep trucking and keep doing the things that you need to do. There's greatness in you. Say it as many times as you have to. It can even start as a whisper. There's greatness in you. But keep repeating it because the mindset works best with consistency. Even when it hurts. Even when it's hard. Keep moving forward. Keep doing what you need to do. Keep believing in yourself. There are moments in our lives that we feel completely alone. We feel as though no one knows what we're going through. It is because of the uniqueness of the challenges that confront you are so unique to you that you feel like I'm up against it all by myself. It's an uphill battle. And along that road, you're not going to see too many friends. You're going to see your shadow most often. See, the thing is, for many people, they've tried the same path you're on, and they failed. As you walk this journey, you're going to see carcasses all over the place of people that didn't quite have it. 
is that your success is like a spotlight shining down on their missed opportunities. Success, many will love you for it. The majority will hate you because your success reminds them of where they could have done it but they came up short and how they didn't revisit it. The difference between a winner and a loser, the failure is there every single time. It's just the winner gets back up and does it again until it goes his way. So now you're down that path and you're all alone. And generally, that type of circumstance is born because it's not because you don't have anybody to talk to, but can you trust them? Eventually, even the most disciplined amongst us, the corners of your mouth will droop down. Your smile will turn into a frown. Eventually, even if you have to wait till everybody's gone to sleep, a tear will run across the bridge of your nose because you're dealing with stuff that is so deep and so complicated that you feel like you're in it by yourself. But you are not alone in the battle. You're not alone in the struggle that God has a strategy. And when it's all over, you're going to see that even though you couldn't see him. He was there all the time. I promise you guys, if today you never say good enough, tomorrow you'll always have enough. What I'm saying is the character of who you are. The character defines the success, defines the fame, and it starts right there. Championships aren't won in the theater of the arena. They're won in the thousands of hours in the training room, in the labs, in the 5 a.m. runs. When everyone else is sleeping, that's when it's won. The Harvard champion is a light switch that's always on. It doesn't go on and off when someone's watching. It's constant. It begins right now with no one looking, man. And how you hold yourself, how you see yourself. What do you do when no one's watching? If you do it then, I guarantee you, you'll be doing it when everyone's watching. Your heart your life, your happiness is your responsibility and your responsibility alone. It's not your fault if your partner cheated and ruined your marriage, but it is for damn sure your responsibility to figure out how to take that pain and how to overcome that and build a happy life for yourself. As long as we're pointing the finger and stuck in whose fault something is, you are stuck in suffering. The road to power is in taking responsibility. Take full responsibility for what happens to you. Accepting full responsibility. It's the day you know you've passed from childhood to adulthood. Learn to reap in the fall without apology if you do well and without complaint if you don't. That's maturity. I used to have that long list of reasons why I wasn't doing well. I blame my negative relatives. They were always putting me down. I blame my cynical neighbors. They're just selfish, looking out for themselves. Won't loan you money? I used to blame the economy. I blame the community. That's a pretty good list for not doing well, isn't it? The road to power is in taking responsibility. Your heart, your life, your happiness is your responsibility and your responsibility alone. Taking responsibility, accepting responsibility is not an admission of guilt. Taking responsibility is a recognition of the power that you seize when you stop blaming people. It's not like you're letting somebody who wronged you off the hook. Taking responsibility is taking your power back. A few months later, I learned very quickly to tear up my list, reasons for not doing well, and I threw it away. And I got me a fresh piece of paper, and I put one word on it, me. There's a black heritage spiritual that says, it's not my mother, nor my father, nor my brother, nor my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's not what happens, it's what you do. If anything can go wrong, it will. That's one of Murphy's laws. So here's one of the key questions of the evening. Starting tomorrow, what are you going to do that'll make a change in your life's direction? Now see, if you don't do something starting tomorrow that'll make a difference, guess what? Because the next five are gonna be like the last five unless you, major key, tomorrow, change it all. Or change a little, or change something, or don't change. It's choice time, you can do whatever you want. But it's nice to know any day you wish you can change your whole life. 
we go through the actions of commitment, but we're not really committed. We're not really connected. We're not really joined because we have no understanding of our responsibility to any relationship. You cannot have true relationship without reciprocity. You cannot get into a relationship to get and not give. You collect anniversaries, you've got a lot of birthdays, but you've never been the person that you could be because the could be is locked up behind commitment and until you're committed, you'll never get the could be. Wonder what would have happened in school if you'd been committed. Wonder what would have happened in your marriage if you'd have really thrown your whole self. You've always been casual. In what you've done with your life thus far, is it giving you what you want? Is it giving you what you want? When you look toward the future, when you look at all that's going on out here, is there some place within yourself you say, hey, I know I need to be out there in that arena. I know I can do more than what I've been doing. Is that something that you begin to look at within yourself? See, I say if you look at your life, and if you're not getting what you want, you owe it to yourself to do something differently. If you're on a job, 85% of Americans go to jobs that they're unhappy. If you're doing something eight hours a day that you don't like, it's not giving you what you want, it's not giving you a strong feeling of satisfaction and fulfillment. If that's what it is, you owe it to yourself to start strategically working to change directions. Most people will resist change. Most people will fight change as if change would be worse than what they're experiencing. Most people will not challenge the unknown. They won't just step out there. See, there are certain things that's got to be in place. They've got to see it all together. And life isn't like that. That's not how you grow. As you begin to look toward the future, begin to know that whatever it takes for you to create that, you got that. You've got genius in you, you've got goodness in you. If you decide to take the initiative to change the current quality of your life, I say to you that you will find that the universe is on your side. Would it be easy? No. Will you have some opposition? Yes. Will I make a lot of mistakes? Yes. See, a lot of people won't try anything different in life because they don't want to get hurt. Pain is everywhere. But most people spend their life not wanting to deal with the pain of rejection, the pain of being disappointed, the pain of being criticized, the pain, the pain. That's called life. But guess what? There's no gain without pain. If you don't know exactly what you want or you let yourself get beyond that into something general, you're not going to achieve it. Clarity is power. You've got to know the specific result you're after. What do you want? Why you're doing it? Because you know what? You may get a big goal as soon as I want to make a billion dollars. I want to bring peace to the earth. Why? Because as soon as you come up with a goal, all the obstacles show up. So you've got to get yourself past that. And the way to get past that is have enough reasons. Reasons come first, answers come second. To ask intelligent, you've got to know why you want it, have enough drive to make it happen, enough juice to make it happen. If you don't have enough reasons, you will not make it happen. What is going to get you to actually fall through? Because the first plan's not going to work and the second plan's going to work, so you better have enough plans that if the first two don't work, you still got something else. Otherwise, you're going to be having excuses why it didn't work. That's a pain. Don't you know that's something? When you know, I was in a seminar once and this lady stood up. If I had my life to live over again, she talked about all of the things that she would do. And you can feel the pain of regret in her voice. She was trying not to experience the pain of defeat, the pain of disappointment, the pain of loss. And she still experienced pain. It was right there. Most people are governed by their habits, their fears, and the opinions of others. A lot of people never try anything differently because they have been convinced by people in their lives that they value that they can't do it. They're living within the context of the opinions that other people have of them. The low expectations. Many people doubt themselves because when they thought about doing something at some critical point in their life, somebody they respected and honored, someone they trusted said, you can't do that. And they accepted that.